good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us for today's Jenna conversation. Now, you should be able to see us, but we can't see you. So um, speaking out into the void, but I just want to say um, a huge thank you for joining us for this, this first ever Jenna conversation. Uh, and to tell you a little bit about the background to it. In 1796, Edward Jenner started a series of clinical trials into the use of the mild disease cowpox to protect against the feared disease smallpox, the world's first vaccine. And in doing so, he gave birth to one of the most important and successful tools in the history of medicine. And vaccination, as I'm sure many of you know, now saves between two and three million lives each and every year. Uh, and I believe that all of this was made possible by crucial aspects of Jenner's character, specifically his ability to see beyond the confines of a single discipline and to listen to the views of others, to have a conversation. My name is Owen Gower and I'm the museum manager at Dr Jenner's house, the birthplace of vaccination. We share the story of Jenner's work and his legacy from his adult home, the Chantry, the house where he told the world about his discovery. Dr Jenner's house is maintained by the Jenner Trust, which is an independent charity in receipt of no regular public funding. And under normal circumstances, we employ the equivalent of just full to two full-time members of staff, assisted by a number of dedicated volunteers. Today's conversation has been made possible with the support of the National Lottery Heritage Fund via emergency funding designed to help us continue our work despite the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Whilst this event is free of charge, we are reliant on the generosity of members of the public to enable us to continue our work and to preserve Jenner's house for future generations. And if you would like to find out more about us, register for other Jenner conversations in this series, or to make a donation, please do visit our website, jennermuseum.com. This is our first Jenner conversation, and whilst we have tested and practiced thoroughly, I hope that you'll forgive any technical glitches. If you need assistance, please contact us directly through the chat function, and my colleague Casey will be working hard behind the scenes to ensure everything runs smoothly. We have set time aside for questions at the end, and you can access that using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Please go on there, enter your questions, and we will try and answer as many as possible. If you are tweeting about it, please use the hashtag Jenna Conversations. And just finally from me in terms of housekeeping, at the end of the discussion, you'll be invited to take part in a short survey. It should only take you about five minutes of your time to complete, and it would be very much appreciated as it helps us to develop our programmes. On the 8th of May, 1980, the World Health Assembly declared that the world and all its peoples have won freedom from smallpox. This monumental achievement in public health history was the culmination of the work started by Edward Jenner in 1796 to develop the world's first vaccine. But how was it achieved? And are there any lessons we might be able to apply to our own situation today? Joining us today are two veterans of the World Health Organization's Smallpox Eradication Programme. Paul Fine is Professor of Communicable Disease Epidemiology at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. From 1978 to 2006, he directed the Karonga Prevention Study, exploring leprosy, tuberculosis and HIV in rural populations in Malawi. And his recent focus has been on the evaluation of vaccine efficacy. David Heyman is Professor of Infectious Disease Epidemiology at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and Head of the Centre on Global Health Security at Chatham House. David's public health career has seen him responding to smallpox, the first, second and third outbreaks of Ebola hemorrhagic fever and to monkeypox outbreaks. And he's also led the World Health Organization programmes on AIDS and the global response to SARS. At the World Health Organization, David has been Assistant Director for Health Security and the Director General's representative for polio eradication. And from 2012 to 2017, he was Chairman of Public Health England. And chairing today's discussion is Gareth Williams, Emeritus Professor of Medicine and Honorary Senior Research Fellow in English at University of Bristol. Gareth's medical research saw him focus on diabetes, and in 2003, he was appointed Dean of Medicine and Dentistry at the University of Bristol. Gareth spent time as a trustee of the Jenner Trust, and here he became fascinated by Edward Jenner and the history of smallpox. His first book for a general readership was Angel of Death, The Story of Smallpox, which was shortlisted for the Welcome Medical Book Prize in 2010. He has followed this up with Paralyzed with Fear, The Story of Polio, A Monstrous Commotion, The Mysteries of Loch Ness, and Unraveling the Double Helix, The Lost Heroes of DNA. And no doubt there's another book in the offing. Please do take it away, Gareth. Everybody and Owen, thank you very much indeed for your introductions. Um, this is, as you say, the first of a series of conversations, and I think it's a very topical one. Uh, the history is fascinating, and we're living with 
a present which is uncomfortable from various points of view. And we hope that there will be some lessons from the past which we can apply to today's situation. So I'm going to kick off with a pretty obvious question. Uh, I trained as a medical student and a young doctor during the 1970s, which meant that I never actually saw a case of smallpox. So when I started researching it, I had an awful lot to learn. So here's a shortcut. I'm going to ask these two experts, David and Paul, to tell us a little bit about smallpox. What was it? What was it like clinically? What are their clinical recollections? Where did it come from? Um, just a thumbnail sketch to start with, and then we'll take it on from there. David, could you start us off, please? Well, thanks. Thanks, Gareth. I'm really pleased to be with you this afternoon. And yes, uh, smallpox was quite a, a fearful disease, in fact. If you saw a patient with smallpox, um, you never forgot what that patient looked like. It was a terrible disease which disfigured, which caused facial scarring in those who recovered, and oftentimes blindness as well from lesions on the, the cornea. Smallpox was caused by two viruses, smallpox variola major and variola minor. Minor had a lesser case fatality rate, but variola major had a case fatality rate of up to 40%, which means 40% of those people infected died. They died not only from the weeping lesions of smallpox, but they also had superficial bacterial infections on those lesions and many times septicemia as a result. So it was a, a very violent disease. And in our lifetime, in, in, 19, uh, in 1969, when smallpox uh, eradication intensified, in that year, there were 2.7 million deaths from smallpox. If you put that on a graph of mortality today, without escalating it for population increases, it would be the number one cause of mortality among the infectious diseases. Paul will have some other observations, I'm sure. Paul, what do you think? Very, very nice, David. Uh, say, as well, I'm very happy to be part of the first gender, gender conversation. Um, David's description. David, David was with the smallpox program for, well, he can say precisely how long, but a good deal longer than, than I, and saw many more cases than I. I saw only a couple of cases. I arrived in India towards the end of the program. I spent three, month, three months there. Um, so much of my knowledge of, of the clinical manifestations are from what I've seen and read and a couple of cases that I have seen. Um, I might say another couple of things uh, beyond what, what David did. Um, you, in your introduction, you asked about the origin. Mm. Um, it's the smallpox virus is part of the orthopox family of viruses. There are orthopox viruses which infect a number of animal species, cowpox being one, camelpox. In recent years, monkeypox has been discovered. And I believe that the that the viral geneticists think that the smallpox virus may have evolved originally from a rodent pox virus several tens of thousands of years ago. Um, but then it became these two, the two uh, strains, if you will, that David mentioned, variola major and variola minor. Um, the clinical course was such that after infection, there was an incubation period of, it said seven to 17 days, um, uh, about 10, 15 days. Um, starting with a prodrome, a uh, general feeling of malaise and fever, and then the rash starting uh, in a couple of days later. And the rash um, was characteristic for smallpox, very different from chickenpox. The lesions came out simultaneously um, for smallpox, whereas over, over in, 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 in chickenpox, you get, you get the, the lesions starting over, over a few days. Um, lesions of smallpox were generally on the extremities more than on the trunk. And they go through the second successive stages of a, a macule, then a papule, then a vesicle, and then, and then a, a, a pustule, which then scabs over, and as David mentioned, often accompanied by bacterial superinfections. I think a very important thing about smallpox was that uh, one, it had a very high case to infection ratio. Virtually everyone who was infected became clinically ill. And we're gonna talk about another infection in a little while, which is very different um, in that characteristic. And that's a very important uh, factor about smallpox. 
um, you could see virtually all of it. And secondly, it was very easy to recognize. I, I have a veterinary background. I had no problem recognizing the two cases of smallpox that I, that I saw. Very dramatic, characteristic uh, presentation. Well, thank you. In your front pocket there, you've got a photograph of a young lad who is effectively immortal, but he does rather illustrate the clinical features of smallpox. Can you just show us? It's a, it's a rather grisly photograph, so I hope Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> this, um, explain. Right, so this yeah. is a lad who is at the pustular stage of smallpox. And yes. tell, tell us a bit about the background, because this is a fascinating image with a lot of history. Yes, well, this is, uh, this is, this is, this is a recognition card. Um, which, and uh, David and I handled many of these in our time in the program. Field workers always carried them. And when they inquired about smallpox, they could show this and say, have you seen this disease? Um, and uh, you're right, this is immortal. This, I, don't, I, I don't know the origin of you know, who that was when the photogra photograph was taken, but it's now a classic image of, of smallpox. Thank you very much. You've mentioned a little bit, uh, both of you, about the impact of smallpox through the ages. And again, we're turning to COVID-19 in a moment where some of the statistics will not superficially look quite as scary. But how, how would you rate smallpox compared with the Black Death or other human plagues that have afflicted us through, through the centuries? Would you say smallpox was the greatest ever or the most feared or the greatest mutilator? How would you rate it? You know, maybe I'll start by saying that if you look back in records in the United Kingdom in London, records of disease by Gant and different people, you'll find that smallpox was already a disease that they were very concerned about and they counted the number of cases they had. In fact, there were four diseases that were the fear of the world at that time um, and through the centuries that followed. One was cholera, one was yellow fever, one was smallpox and the other was plague. And all of those diseases caused outbreaks that came and went. And when they came, they decimated populations. They created a type of herd immunity, which made the populations immune for a time because they did provide solid immunity, most of them, not cholera, but the others. And then they disappeared and came back again. So they were this constant threat to populations, afraid that they would come back again to infect them. And, and this led to many different ways of trying to deal with infection and prevent infection, including some practices of variolation, which used actual smallpox to inject into other people and, and finally cowpox. So it was a very, very difficult disease to deal with and very feared among the four most feared diseases in, in the world before the 20th century. Thank you. Paul, anything to amplify there or add to? Well, it's interesting, David, David um, selected classic pandemic diseases um, in mentioning plague and, and uh, cholera, cholera there. One can think of it as you use the word horrific, what your scale about, uh, about horrific disease. Um, clinical manifestations, absolutely horrific, but if one thinks on terms of individual cases, um, you want to, what are you going to compare it with? Um, leprosy, not nice. Um, drug resistant tuberculosis, not nice. Rabies, etc. There are a good many diseases that are that are of dreadful severity. Uh, but but smallpox had this uh, universal um, universal endemic prevel pre prevalence um, uh, throughout the world. And you gave a figure at the beginning. I think of numbers of proportion of deaths over history attributable to smallpox was very substantial. Well, thank you both. Uh, that sets the scene nicely for what must be one of the greatest uh, success stories ever in public health, which was the total eradication of smallpox. And this was something that Edward Jenner was dreaming about and which uh, President Jefferson of the US wrote to Jenner in the early 1800s. So a couple of years after vaccination, the news of vaccination broke, if you like. And in that letter, Jefferson predicted the disappearance of smallpox and told Jenner in his letter that this is 
for what he would be remembered. So the eradication campaign, um, it was a pretty big, bold initiative. And clearly the world was already on the way to getting rid of smallpox for all time. But David, could you remind us why the WHO decided that eradication of smallpox was a feasible project and how, they, how and when they decided to go for it? Well, Paul's already mentioned one of the characteristics of the virus and its infection, which was very important to eradication. And that was that you could find every infection clinically. So a person who manifested signs and symptoms of smallpox probably had smallpox, unless you could not differentiate it from hemorrhagic chickenpox. But it was a disease which clinically expressed in the same manner for every infection. In addition, after infection or after vaccination, there was solid immunity, which was lasting immunity, which protected against future uh, infection. In fact, if you vaccinated a person four days into infection who had been infected within four days, you could modify the course of disease by, making the, by, by providing immunity that decreased the severity, and those people were usually able to survive without difficulty. In addition, smallpox didn't have a vector in nature or a reservoir. It didn't have a mosquito that transmitted it. It didn't have a vector that carried the virus. It had vectors that carried similar pox viruses, but not this pox virus. And finally, the feasibility had been shown in industrialized countries, which used the vaccine in immunizing entire populations. Although, as you'll hear later on, it didn't require immunization of the entire population to eradicate. Thank you. And Paul, any thoughts about the origins of the eradication campaign or the rationale? Did, do you personally think it was the right thing uh, to go for? I, I guess thing? what David said is excellent, but I might take another perspective. Why did WHO decide on this as a target when it did? That's, that's what I'm interested in because uh, and, they're and arguing for malaria as well. Uh, WHO, David knows WHO far better than, than do I, but we all know it started after the catastrophe of World War II, when the world recognized the need for global governance. And it was one of the major family of organizations of World Health Organization, along with um, you know, for re refugees and FAO and one thing or another. It started about 1947, and I think there was a great deal of idealism in it, thinking about what can one do for the world. Mm. And yes, there were these tools being developed. Antibiotics had just been developed and vaccines being created. How can we use them? You mentioned that, that the first target for global eradication that was set by WHO was for malaria. And that's an interesting story, but that could be another Jenner conversation. Why was that decision made in the mid 50s a much, much, much more difficult target? It was three years later in 1959 that the World Health Assembly first mentioned smallpox eradication. And it was quite interesting as it got caught up in a little bit of Cold War politics because the resolution to the World Health Assembly came from Russia, from the man who ended up leading the Russian program, Zhdanov. And I think the Western countries thought, ah, oh, that was a very smart thing for them to do. It was a, a wise resolution to put forth the World Health Assembly and the world gathered around it. And so the program started then, it was rather optimistic, in the resolution of the World Health Assembly, it said one could eradicate smallpox by just vaccinating 80% of people within five years. We know it was not that simple, but that's, that's what started, 1959. And immunization increased tremendously around the world from that point. They saw it going down. And then in the, in the late 60s, I think it was 1967, they set a 10-year target. 10 years. And, but it was still focusing on raising the general level of immunity in the population, relying on herd immunity. But then there was a shift of policy a couple of years later, occurred in Nigeria when it was recognized that 
by focusing vaccination around cases, spending the energy to identify where the cases were, and then ring vaccination. That term that has been recently come, has recently come back in the context of Ebola, it was developed then for smallpox in 1970. And when Bill Fagy first introduced it, he described smallpox disappeared before his eyes when the strategy changed. And so the global strategy changed after then and through the 1970s. And David and I watched, uh, and the world watched smallpox disappear with that, with that shift of program. So Paul, just right. to clarify, the, the ring vaccination was where you would be surveying You'd be surveilling large areas. You would use your smallpox recognition cards and local contacts. You would identify the very beginning of an outbreak and you'd get in there and you'd throw everything that you had at it. Is, is that right? I mean, Ab absolutely. A, a, a lot of, of the effort was spent in going house to house with this card, yeah. with this card, asking people if they'd seen this disease. And when one was found, okay, that, that, that case was sequestered in that household and everyone in a surrounding region up to a mile around that house was vaccinated. Thank you. And so the energy was put for case finding and then vaccination around the cases. Right. And David, do you have any recollections, particular anecdotes that stick in your mind from that time, applying this strategy and whether it worked, whether it failed? Tell, tell us about what it was actually like on the ground. You know, it, it, what Paul said earlier is really true. Eradication occurred before our eyes. If you found persons with smallpox, got them isolated properly, got the medicines that they needed into the household to support them by their families and help their families support them, and then vaccinated 30 households around, or if it was an apartment complex, uh, the floors above and below, including the floor, you saw smallpox just disappear from the area where you were working. It was quite phenomenal. It was a very effective strategy. And the reason it was developed, as I understand it, Paul, you may correct me, is that Bill Fagy, in working in Biafra at that time, had a shortage of vaccine. And so he decided the best way to conserve it would be to build a wall of immunity around patients, which is what he did. And so it was a spectacular program of searching for persons who had smallpox, isolating them, and vaccinating 30 households around them and all the known contacts. Very spectacular. In front of your eyes, you saw smallpox disappear. So the WHO set itself the seemingly impossible target of eradicating smallpox within 10 years, and it took them, what, just over 11 in the end? It took more years. It started yeah. in 1959, and yeah. then it went on through 67. But, but as Paul said, and Paul come in on this, Paul said in 67 is when the intensified efforts yeah. started in the midst of the Cold War, which was quite incredible, because Paul and I were working side by side with technical people from Russia, from all over the world in that program, yet our governments were having arguments amongst themselves. Yeah. How did you both feel when Target Zero, which was the, the shorthand for the complete eradication of smallpox, was announced in, in May 1980? Was that champagne corks popping or just a sober look at what had been achieved? How, how did you both feel personally? Paul, how, how did you feel? Ah, uh, well, um... David and I were of a, I feel very grateful for having been born when I was born. There are certain things that the, my cohort has experienced. And among them was the, the opportunity to join that program. And I felt, I felt of course, the thrill of a huge success like this, but it, I felt almost above all the gratitude that I'd had the opportunity to be a part of it. And that was an accident of history. Yeah. Thank you. David? I would certainly agree with that. I think all of us who worked in the smallpox eradication program 
felt that we were extremely lucky to be at the right place at the right time. I think when Target Zero was finally met, it was really not a surprise to any of us because we saw how effective the program really was in the field. It took, it took some helicopters and, and extra work to find the last case and to contain that last outbreak, which by the way was very all a minor and not major occurring in natural surroundings. But as you know, the last case of smallpox was in the United Kingdom in an accident in Birmingham in the laboratory there. So, you know, uh, we learned a lot, uh, but I think that when Target Zero came, it was just this overwhelming gratitude of having worked with so many wonderful colleagues in a program, and those colleagues still remain colleagues today. It was quite an, uh, quite an amazing experience for all of us who were so young at the time. And you, you both mentioned the Cold War, and when smallpox was eradicated, the WHO then went around the world closing down the smallpox labs really for the principles of public safety. Uh, but they very democratically at the end of the, during the Cold War, they divided sample stocks of smallpox virus, which, is kept, which are kept in liquid nitrogen. And there's one lot at the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta, Georgia, in the US. And there's another lot in Novosibirsk in Russia. Now, do you personally think, because I know that opinion is divided over this, do you think that we should be squandering resources on keeping stocks of an extinct virus, an otherwise extinct virus, going? What, what, what is it used for? What purpose does it serve? Paul, what, what do you think? Turn that to David first. But or, 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 um, This has been debated now for 21 decades, and I believe that there's an orthopox committee that meets in Geneva every so many years to discuss this problem. I have not been part of that discussion. Yes, um, the, those who favor preservation, I'm sure that they argue uh, it's under very safe, secure conditions, and it's pretty cheap to keep it in um, these freezers in Novosibirsk and in, in Atlanta, I believe, and that this virus might be useful for testing vaccines and drugs in the future. And then those who want to, to get rid of it entirely say, look, there's always a risk of its escaping. You can't be 100% secure. We, that's what would be absolutely dreadful, dreadful if it did escape. And I suspect that there's a, another argument raised around that table, and that is that I believe the virus is now, uh, could be synthesized de novo if somebody really wanted to. The gene sequence, it's a DNA virus, the gene sequence is known, and I suspect a clever vi virologist could create it, create it again. Horrible, horrible thought. But if it comes down to the value of keeping the, these, these viruses, um, um, that would be part of, part of the, uh, the discussion. Thank you. And David, your thoughts on that? Yes, you know, there were attempts every few years at the World Health Organization to pass a resolution to destroy the virus. And they were, there were very various arguments made as to why not to destroy the virus. But then in the early 2000s, an argument came that nobody could really dispute because Alibek, who was a, 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 a researcher in the Soviet Union at that time or previously, defected or came to the West and indicated that indeed uh, they had been trying to weaponize the smallpox virus and that it was outside the laboratory in Novosibirsk. Well, that created great concern in many circles, not in WHO circles, which is not involved in bioterrorism, but in many other circles. And they asked WHO at that time to do several things. Number one was to develop new materials for, the, for dealing with the public health problem of smallpox, should it occur again. But also to set up a research committee to oversee research in smallpox. And that committee exists today. And the agreement was that when that committee said that there was no longer any need for smallpox research, that the virus would then be destroyed. The committee has not yet said that. The committee reviews every year 
what's going on. They haven't said that. And I expect that research will go on for quite a while more. But that research has been important in developing new diagnostic tests, which might at some point be useful, and also new vaccines and an antiviral, which is effective against smallpox. That was done because of the concern of some countries that smallpox would be used as a bioweapon, but that's never been confirmed. And the research goes on and on and the virus continues to exist in these two areas and possibly at sites elsewhere. Thank you. Well, just following on from that, do you think that smallpox could ever come back? Um, Paul's reminded us that the DNA sequence is known of, of all the strains, if I remember right. And if, also, if I remember right, uh, the horsepox virus, which is pretty similar, uh, has been synthesized end to end in a, in a very uh, cutting edge molecular biology lab. So two questions, really. Do you think smallpox could come back? And if it did, then how would we cope? Paul? It could. <laughs> if it's in at least two labs, um, something could happen um, by mistake or by evil design from some individual. I think the, I think the probability is extraordinarily small. The virus may be found in uh, elsewhere. And I think, uh, you know, one of the possibilities, it's in a vial in the bottom of a deep freeze somewhere in some medical research institute in a place you've never heard of. Um, so it, it, could, it could come back. Um, it would be dreadful if, if that were so. Um, there are stockpiles of smallpox vaccine, mm -hmm. um, which are maintained, um, WHO oversees them, and I believe there are two or three places around the world. Um, the knowledge is out there on how to deal with smallpox outbreak. Um, the, th there's very little immunity left in the, in the population. Uh, vaccination stopped in the UK in 1970, etc. You know, people, a few old old codgers like David and I probably have a few antibodies left, but in ter in the in the population at large, very little immunity, so it would spread fast. On the other hand, it's got a serial interval of a couple of weeks. It doesn't spread as rapidly as something like a, an influenza, for example. So. Um, it's easily recognized. One knows what to do. It would be a major international event and a number of people would die. Um, I think it would be, of course, the nature of the outbreak would be a function of the release. If it were a lab accident and, you know, I'm sure the technicians in those two labs, I'm sure they're vaccinated. But if somehow it got out into a, you know, uh, CDC or some that, well, that would be lit and that would be uh, limited quite rapidly. If, on the other other hand, there were evil design behind it and somebody, you know, uh, uh, released an aerosol of it somewhere with a large number of people going off in various directions, it could be a dreadfully difficult challenge. I think uh, public health is, is up to, is, uh, knows how, I think we know how to deal with it. Yeah. Um, and it would, it would be dealt with and stopped, but it would not be funny. No, uh, thank you. Uh, David, are you prepared to be more or less optimistic or pessimistic than that? Yeah, well, I just come back to what Paul said about it maybe lurking somewhere in the depths of a freezer. Because actually in the 1990s, we received a phone call from a government at WHO that said, we've just found what we believe is smallpox virus in a container in the bottom of our freezer. And I was at that time working with the Emerging Infections Program and we had not really had experience with the smallpox virus, but 
lo and behold, there was a protocol of how that virus should be destroyed, should it be found in a freezer somewhere. And so that protocol was activated. It went to the country. There was a group that went from WHO to work with the country, and that, vac that virus was indeed destroyed. So there is a protocol that exists. There's pretty good surveillance. People are looking. They're on the outlook for lots of things, including monkeypox. Yeah. So, you know, if they do find monkeypox, which appears very clinically similar to smallpox, um, and they report that, if it were smallpox, it would be identified. Yeah. Do I believe that there will be a bioterrorism event? I don't know. Nobody knows. And I would just, like Paul, think it would be a terrible uh, event should it occur, should there be someone so evil as to try to infect people deliberately with a virus which causes such serious illness. So hopefully it will never occur, but one never knows. Thank you. Well, hopefully indeed. Um, we've got several minutes left um, before we take any questions from the audience out there. So possibly we could fill that time just trying to see if there are any lessons that we can extrapolate from our experience of smallpox to the current COVID-19 pandemic. And just to set the scene, um, could each of you just choose your worst, most feared nightmare infection and give it a score of 10 out of 10, and then tell us what score you would give smallpox and what score you would give COVID-19. David, if you could start that one, please. Okay, well, that's, let me first of all give you a lesson on the smallpox taught me that can be applied to any public health emergency or event. And that lesson was use the tools you have when they're available because you don't know what might happen tomorrow. And in smallpox, it was almost ironic that in 1980, smallpox was declared eradicated. In 1981, a new infection, HIV, was first identified. And in 1985, a military recruit in the US was vaccinated with the smallpox vaccine that was used to eradicate smallpox, developed generalized vaccinia, which is a reaction to the vaccine virus. And this was an AIDS defining event. This military recruit was HIV infected and didn't know he was infected. And as a result, it was an AIDS defining event. He died six months later. The lesson is use the tools you have when you have them because you don't know what will happen afterwards. So the window of opportunities for smallpox remained open till 1980. If today we had to use that same vaccine to eradicate smallpox, it would be a very dangerous program because there are many people HIV infected in many countries around the world who don't know it, who might have generalized vaccinia and die from the vaccine. So we learned, uh, the lesson I learned was take advantage of the tools you have when you have them. Today for COVID-19, we do have tools that are available. We have diagnostic tests, which if used properly can help us identify people who have the infection and people who need to be isolated and prevent the mortality that's occurring. How does this disease COVID occur uh, compared to smallpox? Well, smallpox to me is on a scale, of, it's number 10 on a scale out of 10. COVID is a much low, at a much lower scale. It's maybe at one or two. And we're seeing that we need now to learn to live with this infection. And we will be able to live with it. And especially people who have comorbidities and are at risk who learn how to prevent themselves from getting infected. So we shouldn't be depending on a vaccine or a therapeutic in the future. We should be doing what we can do today to make sure that we control this infection and make sure that if it is destined to become endemic, it becomes endemic without causing in greater increases in mortality than it already has. Over Great. to Paul. Thank you. Paul. Um, I guess I agree with David on the, sc on the, on the scale. Um, if you put smallpox towards 10, uh, COVID is a much less serious infection. Um, why? It's extraordinary, though. It's stopped the world in its tracks over the last several months. Um, when could compare it with malaria and tuberculosis and HIV and, and, and. But they haven't stopped the world in its tracks over the last several months. We have good programs up and running for all of them. 
but uh, this COVID has has taken uh, taken us by su surprise. Um, it's got this extraordinary age distribution um, where you, we have infections in all ages, but largely asymptomatic in the young and invisible in effect, unless you go out and PCR test individuals. That makes it very difficult when we're, we're being debated on the news <laughs> every day, how to track and trace this infection, where is, where is it, how to deal with it when we get 100 cases in a town and one thing or another. Um, whereas the mortality is in people with predefining conditions and, and uh, older, older, older age groups. So, um, I mean, just looking at, uh, as you say, smallpox is, 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 is that much worse. But how does a disease that only rates one or two and smallpox rates 10 bring the whole world to its knees? What, what's so specific about this particular virus? that has actually managed to do that? Is it the way we've reacted to it or the way the media has treated it? What, what, what do you think is going on? Maybe, maybe I'll take a, a guess at that. Number one is that there's been a misconception by many epidemiologists, by modelers, by many, that this infection is like influenza, that it occurs in waves, that it spreads immediately into the community, that you can't contain outbreaks. That's not so. With this infection, Asia, Asian countries have shown that you can stop outbreaks when they occur, as in South Korea, as in Japan, as in Hong Kong, as in Singapore, you can stop these outbreaks and you can prevent it from spreading rapidly into the community. You can control its entry into the community, if you would. At the same time, um, we've, we've placed the priority on the elderly, Paul and I fit into that category, and maybe you do as well, Gareth, into the That's priority <laughs> where, where the elderly have been favored in this because it's trying to protect them. And there have been some interesting examples of what's sustainable and what isn't. It, Asia has sustainable interventions. They've been able to keep the reproductive number low while the virus enters their countries at a, at a, at a spectacular rate with, with very few lockdowns, but when they occur, they're epidemiological lockdowns because they've traced back from cases to the origin of those cases and found that they occur in a nightclub or somewhere else. So they lock that down for a time and then they open it up again. Yeah. It's not been the same reaction that Europe has had, which has just been a flat lockdown, a blunt tool to, to contain an outbreak which was mainly aimed at preventing a burden on hospitals yeah. in the end. And so by understanding, by misunderstanding that this disease was much like influenza, there have been some strategies developed that really aren't epidemiological based, epidemiologically based. Paul may have many different views than I do though, and I'm sure he does. Paul? Oh gosh, it's so, it's it's so interesting, David. Referred to those several countries that have dealt with it the way they have, and uh, we can see the way it was dealt with in this country or in in the United States. And you know, one of the one of the there's been tr tremendous confusion for, at the top in in this country and and in the United States even more so on this, which has not helped. It has not, not helped. Um, I think having a conserv conservative governments, which uh, emphasize maybe individual liberty rather than communitarian philosophies, hasn't helped with this. Um, you know, recognize your, you know, recommend people to wear a mask, not only to protect yourself, to, but to protect others. This sort, this sort of philosophy. Uh, goes down well, better in some populations than in others. Mm -hmm. And indeed, look at the extraordinary way that China dealt with it. Well, they're dealing with an authoritarian government there, which can do things which many governments can't do and we wouldn't like, many of us would not like them to do. So there is a, there is a, a quandary there. But um, this, this issue of the way governments deal with these sorts of things is extremely important in thinking about um, this whole issue of emerging infections, because this isn't the last one, there will be more. 
Well, thank you, and that's an optimistic note. <laughs> Perhaps we should just check with Owen to see if we have any questions from the audience out there. Owen. Yeah, so we do have one question, one question that's come in, and um, I encourage anyone else who has any questions for, for David, Paul, or indeed Gareth to uh, put them into the Q&A box and send them through to us. But the, uh, the first question to come in is, are there other diseases where there is a pathogen pair like smallpox or cowpox? So I guess that's in the context of having a vaccine like Jenner's vaccine based on, on one disease protecting against the other. David? Yes, well, the, the smallpox vaccine, as, as Paul was just about to say and will follow up with me, does protect against other pox diseases, including human monkeypox. And one of the big concerns after the eradication of smallpox was, would monkeypox replace smallpox in that epidemiological niche of smallpox because people were no longer being vaccinated against smallpox? And what we've seen is that human monkeypox actually is increasing, or at least it's increasingly being found in African countries, and not only increasingly found, but it's able to transmit in longer chains of transmission because populations are no longer vaccinated. After the eradication was certified in 1980, I spent a year in Sub-Saharan Africa with the Centers for Disease Control doing studies in countries um, in West Africa where monkeypox occurred to determine whether children under the age of 15 years who didn't have a smallpox vaccination scar and didn't have any facial scars that might indicate smallpox, actually had orthopox antibody, looking to see whether this virus might be spreading in people who were um, not, um, who had not been vaccinated. In those studies, which were done in five different countries, it showed that smallpox was not at that time um, spreading among populations who were not vaccinated. But I know that Paul did some epidemiological modeling at the end of smallpox, and maybe he could talk a little bit about that, Gareth. Yep, Paul? Um, just, I think, I think your quest, the questioner yeah. um, asked about other examples like cowpox, smallpox. So presumably injecting a benign virus or pathogen. And, and so just to pick up on that, uh, there's, yeah. there's of course the very nice example of, 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 of BCG, which comes from um, the bovine tubercle bacillus and has uh, been attenuated into our tuberculosis vaccine, which has all sorts of problems, but that is the origin of, of BCG from the, the bovine tubercle uh, bacillus. Um, now many of our attenuated vaccines, whether they be for measles or mumps or or rubella, et cetera, are derived by, by genetic manipulation in order to attenuate them rather than starting with some an animal, animal virus, but doing the, it's in a way doing the same sort, sort of thing. Thanks. So, uh, so there are precedents. Yes. Yeah. Owen, do we have any other questions? We do indeed. Um, David, I wonder, could you please expand on your earlier comment that vaccinating individuals known to be exposed to smallpox before clinical manifestation could temper the resulting infection. Is this the characteristic of this particular vaccine or a function of immune response in general? Well, as far as I understand, it's a function of the incubation period of the infection, which is quite long. It can go up to two weeks. And the fact that the vaccine acts rapidly and causes a, a, some kind of a cellular immunity, no doubt, and other types of immunity, which do, in ways that we don't understand, modify the course of illness. And we may see the same thing in, in other um, infections as well. Um, even in influenza, where people have been exposed to the influenza virus, they may the next year have a less serious infection because they have immunity to that virus. That wouldn't be immediately caused immunity, that would be long lasting immunity. But that was the theory on smallpox as to why the vaccine did actually modify the course of illness. Paul, maybe you can add more. Do you understand more about that? 
Well, I think, I think it, what, what you meant there, it's a function of incubation period. And there's, of course, an extremely important example of this, and, and that is post-exposure rabies mm. um, vaccination. Uh, my goodness, that's very widely practiced around the world and highly effective. Thank you, Louis Pasteur. <laughs> And there, we're dealing with an infection with a very long incubation period. So, thank you, Owen. Just whilst uh, we we have two global public health experts here, I just wonder: is there anything that we are at risk of missing because of the focus of of COVID nineteen? Where's next for public health, and is there anything that the eradication of smallpox can tell us about that? Mm. David, would you kick off from that? Paul, I think, was going to speak first. Go ahead. Oh, right. Paul. Sorry, Paul. Yeah. yeah. Uh, global governance. Hmm. Uh, it was WHO that led, organized, coordinated the uh, smallpox eradication program and did it magnificently. And I'm, one of the things that worries me tremendously about trends in a number of countries in recent years is this movement towards nationalism. Mm. Worse off in the United States. Can you, ima can you imagine the United States pulling out its support from WHO? I saw, I noticed that Richard Horton called that a crime against humanity. That is dreadful. And and that's caught up in the, in, in the politics of the US and, and the response to COVID, not a healthy way of dealing with it. Very complicated, that, that would be another gender, <laughs> gen, gender dis, dis, discussion. But to me, a very important lesson is global cooperation. Thank you. David? I might, I might just add to that, that despite these geopolitical tensions today in the world, and there are many, especially between China and the United States. But despite these tensions, and despite the criticism of WHO, the technical arms of WHO continue to work as they've always worked. And that is in harmony with all countries. And I, I chair right now a group at WHO called the STAG IH, which advises the emergencies program. And we're meeting once a week to talk about COVID and to get lessons from countries around the world. Not one country has refused to speak with us or provide us information, whether it be China, whether it be the United States, Mongolia, or Iran. We've had the information we've asked for, countries are sharing it, and that's why the world knows so much about this virus in such a short period of time. Because WHO is there as the body which brings people together and make sure that they debate the issues and understand and look at the evidence and understand what's going on with that evidence. But there's another thing that's also been very particular about this outbreak, which is also very important. And that is that the medical journals are publishing rapidly peer reviewed articles in front of the paywall so that anyone can have access to those articles. So that's another contribution that's going on globally, which is making this outbreak a much different outbreak than others in the past. But technically, WHO is functioning despite the geopolitical tensions and the accusations at the top. And in addition, the medical journals are permitting the researchers to get the credit they need for their university standing, while at the same time getting that information out rapidly. I'm sure anyone who has any public health experience has been bombarded with requests of journal, from journals for peer review of certain articles, and, and everybody is willing to contribute. So it's an amazing environment, despite these geopolitical yeah. tensions at the top. Thank you, thank you both. Um, Owen, I think we've got time for what, one more question. I, there's a generic question which I'd like to put to both David and Paul, and indeed all our audience at the end, which is to do with uh, Dr. Jenna's house. But is there one more question specific to this debate, this conversation? Yeah, so uh, we've just had a few questions that perhaps can be grouped into perhaps just um, a, a brief expansion on, on your thoughts about the um, development of a vaccine against COVID-19, specifically um, how important will that be? And I think you, you covered that um, a bit earlier, David, but... Um, also, if vaccination against COVID-19 can be successfully developed, do we have any in 
uh, inkling, I suppose, at this stage of whether it's likely to be an annual event like a flu vaccination or whether it will be uh, once and, and for all. David. Well, you know, there is uncertainty about whether or not a vaccine can be developed that provides long lasting immunity. We don't understand enough about the immune response yet to really know what will be required in a vaccine. And so it's trial by error that's going on now. I think there's been some um, concerning information recently. Um, this is information that's already known about the human coronaviruses. That is that after a period of three to six months, you can be reinfected with the same virus. We've now seen at least five examples and possibly more in North America, in Europe, and in Asia, where there have been reinfections of people who have had serious illness in the past. And these reinfections have been certified to have been by a different virus through genetic sequencing. And these infections have caused less severe disease than the previous disease that occurred in these people. At least that's the information that's coming out since last week. Mm -hmm. That would mean that after a period of three to four months already, people might be reinfected. So to answer the question about a vaccine, if there is an effective vaccine, and if there is a need for a booster, it could be as frequently as every six months, or it could be at a year or never. We just don't understand enough about the immunity of the, that this virus causes at present to make any kind of a statement. But hopefully there will be a vaccine. Hopefully we'll be able to use it safely in all populations and begin to tame this virus in many ways. Okay. Paul, anything to add? Um, not much, but yes, I th don't think that we've mentioned that the, as many people know, the, the, the COVID is a member of the coronavirus group. There are a number of coronaviruses which circulate constantly in the human population. They, um, they cause common colds. Uh, all of us have been infected with some coronaviruses in, in our past. We have some levels of immunity to these. The interaction of the immune response to these different strains of coronavirus is not well understood. We're learning, learning now on the run with this new one. Um, and I, I would let us hope that we have an effective vaccine that, com that comes along in particular to protect, it, to protect the vulnerable segments of, of, of the population. I rather suspect that this virus is going to end up joining um, the endemic coronaviruses in our, in our population and will rarely cause a severe, severe disease, but for the vast majority of people, they will have met various coronaviruses in, in their early years of their lives and built up immunity to them. That's the way I expect it's going to play out over the next uh, months and years. Well, thank you both. I think that's a relatively optimistic end to that bit of the discussion. Owen, do we have a minute or two left? Absolutely. As, as long as you're all happy to stay on, I'd, I'd love to hear your, your uh, final question, Gareth. Well, my final question is uh, about Dr. Jenna's house. Um, this is a remarkable place. It's where Jenna lived, uh, where he died, where he did all his experiments, where he wrote his interminable letters about being the vaccine clerk to the world. So it really is frozen. a place that should be celebrated in world history. Um, the reality is it's a small... Uh, provincial museum of the sort that is going bust at the rate of one every three months in the UK at the moment. As Owen said, it doesn't get any dosh from central government. It relies on footfall and donations and there aren't any feet falling at the moment because of COVID. So I'd just like to ask each of you just concisely how important you think the preservation of Jenner's house is in terms of global public health. And if you can think of one if you know a fairy godmother <laughs> who's prepared to fly down and drop a million pounds into a pot, that would be great. But failing that, if you can think of another practical tip that might help the museum to live for another century, that would be great. David, what do you think? Well, Gareth, I've actually visited the museum uh, with a colleague, uh, Don Francis, who at that time contributed some of the uh, smallpox statues that he had from, from India. Yeah. And I was very impressed to see this, not only because of its historical um, interest for science, but also for architecture. 
and a good marriage of people who are interested both in the conservation or the preservation of the beautiful buildings in the United Kingdom, as well as the I science. Think David's frozen. Oh, sorry. Paul, can you still hear us? I'm fine. I can hear. Yeah, I'm, can you hear me or not? Yeah. I can hear you fine, David, as well. I think it yeah, might okay. be a connection issue at Gareth's end. Gareth is frozen. Okay. okay. Yeah, well, I think it's, it's, it's a museum that hopefully um, will continue. And I would like to see the museum be able to provide some exhibitions to the major museums in London so that people could see the value of conserving this and be interested in making the trek out to uh, Berkeley to the, uh, to the Jenner House. Paul. Oh. Um, I too have visited the museum many years ago, actually, and um, I would certainly like to see it preserved for the reasons David mentioned. I think in, in re reality, the smallpox story is going to uh, be more histor increasingly an historical uh, uh, anecdote. For many people, the disease is long gone now. And I would think that the Jenner, the Jenner Museum uh, will want to um, use that history um, to, to build upon it and relate it to vaccination nowadays, the development of vaccines, the use of vaccines, the importance of vaccines rather than and not focus only on Daisy and Sarah Nelms and James Phipps. Yes, wonder, wonder, wonderful story. But I, I think the importance of that particular story is going to recede, but the importance of vaccines is only going to increase. And of course, the Jenner story is a, a, a extraordinarily important monument in that story. Well, I, th I think you're both absolutely right. And as we seem to have unfortunately lost Gareth, I will, um, I will continue and, um, and sum up, but certainly very, very interested to hear your thoughts um, on, on all things smallpox and eradication and COVID, but also in terms of the, the future of the museum. And, and definitely, um, I hope that we can continue those conversations as we, we look to rethink how we operate the museum going forwards. And as I say, the, the Jenna conversations are, are just one aspect of that. I'm conscious we've we've overrun slightly, so um, thank you very much for your patience to to everyone listening. Uh, and just a, a final, um, I just wonder, perhaps David Paul, whether you have just a, a final thirty seconds sum up. Whether there's any um, points that you uh, you wish to end on uh, before we finish. Well, maybe maybe I'll start by saying that you know the success of the smallpox program was very influential to the development agencies and. It, from this program, the expanded program on immunizations was developed, which is a program which is providing vaccine to children everywhere in the world. So the, the smallpox program was actually the stimulus for developing this new program by showing that a disease could be controlled, could be eradicated in this case, and sprung off a whole new area, including polio eradication today. Thank you. Oh. Well, I, I, yes, I, I was hoping that we could make that connection, David, that this, of, uh, of, this, of the EPI, which not only it, it provides vaccines, every population in the world, and provided the basis of well baby and child care for peripheral populations throughout the world. It built a cold chain used not only for vaccines, but for other medications throughout the world deserves tremendous, tremendous credit. Uh, and it came out of the smallpox program. It came out of the individuals and the thinking came out of the smallpox program. Brilliant. Thank you. Well, thank you to you, you both. And um, a thank you to Gareth Williams as well, um, wherever he is at the moment. And I'll be in contact with him to, to say thank you. Thank you to everyone who has joined us for our first Jenna conversation. As I say, there will be a, um, a very short survey that should open automatically when we, we end this. And we really would appreciate your, your feedback. Um, thank you very much for, for joining us. And a, a big thank you again to Professor David Heyman and to Professor Paul Fine for your, your time and your generos generosity in sharing your thoughts. Thank you very much.